In this episode of Mind Pump, your favorite fitness, health, and entertainment podcast, we talk about how to maintain your fitness, how to keep your muscle, how to stay strong, or at least keep yourself from losing too much strength when you get sick or especially when you get injured. We actually give you five things you can focus on that if you do these five things, your recovery will be faster, you'll build your muscle back faster than you would have had you not followed these five things, and you'll get back to a place that's possibly better than you left before. Now, this episode is brought to you by PRX, one of our sponsors. PRX makes some of the best at-home gym equipment you'll find anywhere. It's commercial-grade at-home gym equipment that takes up very, very little space. So if you want to have, a, for example, a squat rack, you know, squat racks are, are wonderful. They allow you to do some of the best barbell exercises, but they take up a lot of space. PRX squat racks fold into the wall. They take up maybe 12 inches of space off the wall when folded in. Then when you pull them out, extremely sturdy, extremely secure. But they sell much more than just racks. Go check them out. Use the Mind Pump discount. Go to prxperformance.com forward slash Mind Pump. Use the promo code Mind Pump and get 5% off, plus a free MAPS Prime program. Also, um, this month, we are putting our two most popular fitness programs on incredible sale. So MAPS Anabolic is a full-body workout program that builds muscle, boosts your metabolism, and it's really phenomenal for strength. It's an excellent all-over strength-building program. So that's the most popular program that we have. But we also have our No BS six-pack formula program. This is designed just for the core. If you want your abs to be more visible, you need to build them. In fact, building them will make them more visible at higher body fat percentages. The before and afters people send us from following uh, the No BS six-pack formula are pretty remarkable. People's abs you know, bust out. You can see people's obliques. Their cores look leaner, even though they may not be leaner because they've developed the muscles of their core. Now, both these programs combined, uh, normally it's something like, a, I don't know, it's a, what is it, $150, $160? But right now, in October, you could get both programs combined together for $59.95. That's $59.95. That's it. Lifetime access to both MAPS Anabolic and the No BS six-pack formula. Just go to mapsoctober.com. That's maps, M-A-P-S, October.com. Uh, hurt foot, torn Achilles, torn uh, ACL, MCL. What right now? No, these are just all the things. Oh, jeez! <laughs> like, all the man, all you're... the all the injuries that I've been through in the last. I don't know what is that? Th- am I going on three three years? Three, wait, wait. Years? When did you tend your ACL and MCL? No, that was like that was a while ago. Six years ago. Now, so seven years ago. We were walking yesterday, and you said your foot. I know, dude. It's just, we're still hurting. Yeah. What's mm-hmm. going on? I don't know, dude. I don't know what it is. Being old. You know, my, Shut bo- up. my bones are brittle. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I think I like. I think I have like a small fracture in uh, like one of my very small bones in my feet. Yeah, uh, one that I can't pronounce. Uh, yeah, I think that's what's going. It's been three months and it hasn't fully recovered. So, but anyways, the the reason why I I brought it up is because <clears throat> I, we haven't addressed this really on the podcast, not in full length, but I get DMs a lot um, about injuries. And of course, most people that are into fitness and working out and either building muscle or losing body fat, they're always concerned when something like this happens, mm-hmm. right, rightfully so, that you know oh, they've made all this progress and then an injury happens and how do I not lose all of my gains? And so I think that we should address some of the, you know, the top things that we focus on when this happens. It's inevitable for most people that something is going to happen at one point in your life. Uh, that may, you know, obviously hinder your your training regimen, and how do you how do you navigate around that without losing all of yeah, your games? I get I get DMs. This is a on tough that. one for people. Yeah, I get DMs on that all the time too. It's yeah. probably one of I'd say probably the top five questions I get, which is like, you know, something along the lines of I hurt my shoulder. How do I how do I maintain my fitness? Or or you know, I tweak my back. How do I keep my deadlift from going down? Mm-hmm. Or I hurt my knee. How do I keep my quads uh, from shrinking? So it's a it's a it's a common question. It's also, and I understand why. It's probably one of the more 
frustrating things that can happen to you if you're somebody who's very yeah. dedicated right. to working out because you're on a roll. Usually this is what it looks like, in my, at least in my experience. I'm crushing. Mm -hmm. I'm on a roll. It's almost, it almost never happens when everything sucks. It's always like I'm flying with my progress. Mm -hmm. I'm getting stronger. I'm feeling good. And then either I'll get sick. That's one thing that can happen. Or I'll tweak or twist something or hurt something. And then immediately it's like, because you feel like you're being forced to stop progressing. It's not a choice. It yeah. feels like it's not a choice. It's pretty you know? depressing. You know, for a lot of people, especially when you're on that high of a motivation and you're really putting the work in and being disciplined. And then that just takes, you know, your feet literally right out from under you. And it feels like now I have to start all over. Right, right. And your biggest enemy in this, by the way, is, is the fear of going backwards. It really is because there's a couple things you want to face here. Number one, you uh, the, the reality of the situation is something that you're denying because the reality is you do have to change gears. You are injured, right? Mm -hmm. There's no there's no going around that. Yeah. If you hurt yeah, your back. You have to face the reality of what it is. Yes. So well, you, you have, to, have, you have be, to accept it. You have to be careful too. I mean, because this is, I mean, and I, I remember the first time that I injured my knee, uh, I was in such a hurry to get back and recover. Mm -hmm. And because I, you know, I'm a trainer, I have all the tools, I know what I need to do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I forced it and then end up re-injuring yourself and then setting yourself even further back. So, it is a delicate dance, you know. Totally. You know, how do I maintain uh, the progress that I've made over the last months or years, uh, but at the same time, too, not to overreach and end up uh, setting myself further back? Yeah, and there's also, you know, like you don't want to mask a lot of like your body's signals of what it's telling you while you're doing these movements, because I know, you know, the the tendency is to like really brace up and, you know, kind of work around all these things that your body's telling pain, you know, signals are going off all over the place. But, you know, there's a lot of ways that you could think you're making progression, but you're really just masking a lot of the underlying uh, symptoms. Oh, dude, I have a, a, a wonderful story about that, that I experienced myself. So, you know, years ago, um, you know, I was on the ro I was on a roll, I was working out, I was very consistent. At the time I had just got it started in jujitsu, but I was still lifting weights quite a bit. And um, I was practicing a position and um, I went to post with my left arm and I felt something in my shoulder. It didn't really feel good. Um, and I, I couldn't really tell what it was, but it did hurt. And what I didn't do was uh, rest. I didn't, I didn't allow myself to heal or, or rehab. In, instead, what I did is I started with the ibuprofen. So, okay, my shoulder hurts. Don't want to miss jujitsu. Don't want to miss my workout. Take some ibuprofen. So I did that for a little while, and, and I did get a, away with it for a second. I, I think it was probably a month or two I could take ibuprofen, but I noticed that the over time, the pain started getting a little worse, a little worse, a little worse. Finally, it got so bad to where I couldn't bench press, and I couldn't overhead press, and when I, would, uh, I couldn't do jujitsu, went to the doctor, set up an appointment, and the doctor said, uh, well, you know, he said, do you want to take some time off? Like, what do you want to do? I said, no, I, I don't want to take any time off. He says, well, I can give you a, a cortisone shot Ugh. right on your – it was my AC joint that mm. was injured. Yeah. He said, I can give you a cortisone shot there, and then you'll feel a lot better. Immediate relief. And I said, let's do this. So he, boom, puts the needle right at the point where it hurts, gives me a shot. About two, three days later, felt good again, went right back to training, ended up causing damage to my AC joint and having to get surgery to have my AC joint – Resected. They actually had to re remove some of it. Now, when I went to the doctor to get the surgery, um, I it was became very painfully obvious to me, um, and I would have recognized this in a, in a client. Uh, I didn't recognize it myself because, you know, when you're you're when it's you, you have your own ego in the way, right? So, I recognized in myself that I caused it to get this bad. I got to the point now where I need to have surgery. So, what I did with the surgery was I said, okay, I'm gonna take this seriously. <clears throat> I'm going to take the healing process seriously. I'm not going to push it because I already made that mistake. And, and one thing that helped me was remembering muscle memory. This is a real thing. Um, you know, as a kid, I really injured my knee really bad. And I remember when I finally took the brace off that kept my leg straight, I looked at my left leg and it looked scarily skinny. Like mm -hmm. it, my knee was bigger than my, my femur. And it looked crazy. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, what happened to my leg? And then doing some rehab and doing some exercise. And the muscle came back so quick that it really blew me away. So I thought, okay, no matter what happens, 
with the surgery. I know I'm going to lose my pec. I know I'm going to lose my shoulder and tricep because I'm not going to be able to do pressing or pulling or whatever, but it should come back fast. In that time, I treated it properly. I did everything the right way. I remember when I took the bandages off and I finally, I did look in the mirror and it did look scary. I lost a lot of muscle, but I did everything the right way and it came back and it came back very quickly to the point where, you know, I have wonderful balance between my right and left side. And that taught me a lesson, which is don't be afraid of going backwards because muscle memory is a real thing. How long, it, however long it took you to build your muscle in the first place is not nearly as long as it's going to take to get it back right. when you lose it. If it took you four years to build your arms and then you can't work out for a couple months, it'll take you like four weeks yeah. you know, to build them back. Literally, that's how fast it works. So you got to make peace with that because that if you can't make peace with that, you will screw yourself over. I had the over. same experience with my arm and I broke it in the, the same year, twice. And it was so uh, demoralizing. Uh, I didn't know. And it's my right arm. It's my dominant arm. And it's something that I was, you know, really identifying as an athlete. And I couldn't do all these things like w that I could normally do with my right arm. And taking the cast off, especially for the second time, it was almost like I was just skin and bone. And I just, it was, it was really one of those moments where I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be the same after this. If I, if I really have to like change everything I'm doing to my left side and relearn everything, but you're right. It really came back fast. It came back, um, you know, uh, within an amount of time, I wouldn't even have thought, uh, it, it possible. So it's, it's one of those things that might look scary at first, but it's, it's your body will, yeah. will respond and it, uh, appropriately. And it helps with the fear yeah. because I think if you're focused on the fear, oh my God, I'm going to go back. Backwards. I'll never get be the same. You're more likely to do the wrong thing. Well, especially when you know the first step of the five steps that we listed for this is focus on healing. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and that is, you know, the mistake that I made in the past was still focusing on trying to build muscle and gain and gain mm -hmm. and you know work around this injury versus put all of my effort and energy towards getting better and healing and rehabbing and addressing the root cause that got me there. Like, I feel like you have to explain a little bit more, Sal, about the cortisone shots because I remember as a trainer, this was a massive hurdle for me. One, understanding what exactly is a cortisone shot? Why do so many doctors prescribe it and tell clients when they have issues like this that you dealt with your shoulder and that's the go-to? It was hard to overcome that as a trainer because one, I wasn't educated enough to really understand it and what we were doing to the body by taking one of these shots. Right. And then I had to overcome my clients going, I feel amazing. Mm -hmm. They take this shot in their hip, they take the shot in the shoulder and their or their elbow or wherever. You're trying they, to put the brakes on a little bit to be yeah, oh, and conscious then, of and it. And then they go, I feel amazing, Adam. Mm -hmm. So I'm just gonna go get another cortisone shot in a few months if I need one. And what I learned later on was we were never addressing the root cause. And not only were we not addressing the root cause, we also were setting these clients up for failure. No, it's the equivalent of driving your car, hearing a funny noise from your engine, and just turning up the radio so you don't hear the engine anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, totally. literally, it's literally the same thing. So what a cortisone shot does is it, it – it, you know, because here, here's why you feel pain from an acute injury. So you hurt your shoulder – uh, your body sends inflammatory you know, factors and markers over to the area. You get increased inflammation. That's also a signal for repair, healing, uh, for all the good stuff to happen. You feel the pain, which prevents you from moving it. This is a good thing because it allows the area to heal. Injecting a cortisone shot there immediately reduces the localized inflammation. So now you've reduced the pain, but you've also reduced all the important signals that tell the body to heal. Over time, repeated cortisone shots have been proven to cause joint degeneration. Not only that, but if you take away the noise, right? If your car is making noise and you turn up the radio, now you're 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 just the, the noise eventually will get louder because you're not fixing the root cause. So if I'm moving improperly and that's what causes my shoulder pain, and I take the pain away, I haven't fixed what caused it in the first place. I'm going to continue to move wrong and I'm going to cause more problems uh, down the road. So mm -hmm. this is the this is the challenge. This is why focusing on healing is so important because the focus on healing not only allows you to heal and recover, but it also gets you to focus on what caused the problem in the first place. Why did I hurt my shoulder or why does my knee hurt? 
not just that it hurts, but what caused it to hurt in the first place. Is it because I used too much weight? Is it because I didn't have good stability? Is it because my form and my muscle recruitment patterns aren't great? Address that. Otherwise, what will happen is you will continue to revisit this problem. This is why a, a good chunk of people who have uh, pain – or tend to hurt themselves, it tends to be a repeated injury. If you mm -hmm. talk to somebody who ha has hurt their back in the past, ask them how many times they've had that same injury. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, you'll hear a number like three or four. Oh, I hurt my back. And how often, how many times have you heard, oh, it's been a few times, or I hurt my knee, which knee, my left. How many times have you hurt your left knee? Ah, like three or four Well, and times. that's where we get the saying where clients would say things like, I have a bad knee, or yes. I have bad hips, or I have yeah. a bad back. It, it, you start to identify with a, a bad area of your body because it constantly gets injured, and so you just assume that, oh, I have a bad low back, I have a bad knee, I have a bad hip. It's constantly bothering me. I'm always having to get cortisone shots, and it just becomes this vicious cycle, and we never really address the root cause. You never focus on truly healing correctly and then getting to the bottom of why did I get in this place in the first place and what do I need to do to avoid this in the future? Right. And I think people need to like understand healing isn't just not doing anything and laying down and elevating and, you know, immobilizing like healing. There's a lot more, you know, involved in healing and, you know, movement is a part of that, uh, but it's, it has to be appropriate and it has to be addressing uh, the type of movement that was creating the problem for you. Like, yeah. You have to identify that. Yeah. And studies show this, like when people have surgery, uh, if you've ever gone to the, the hospital and had surgery or procedure, they'll, they'll encourage you when it's appropriate to walk mm -hmm. uh, through the hospital. Prevents blood clots. It's also been shown to speed up healing. So that's what we mean by moving because there are right. moments when, when you should not move the area that's injured, right? You, yeah. you broke your Especially arm. Especially an acute injury, yeah. Exactly. But but moving otherwise, which means don't just lay on the couch and be depressed unless you need to just lay down, unless that's what's recommended. Mm -hmm. But you could just go for a light walk or moving. That's also part uh, of the healing process. But healing is the most important thing. That's why it's number one in this list because nothing will prevent you from – or nothing will make you lose muscle. Nothing will make you get out of shape more than failing to heal. Like if you, you can have all the strategies in the world, but if you get in the way of the healing process, you ain't going to go anywhere because an injury stops you right there, dead yep. in your tracks. It prevents you from moving forward. Now, are there, did you guys use tools? I mean, I this is what I love like ice baths for too. Like during this this time, like you because you have so much inflammation normally in an area that's injured. Um, instead of blunting it with something like ibuprofen. Um, I'll do something more natural where I'm using like ice baths to bring down the inflammation. And even though you guys both alluded to when you have an acute injury that you need to leave it alone and rest, at one point it eventually heals and it is time to move that area. Yeah. Right. And when it is time to move that area, I don't go right back into strength training that area. Most of my focus is on mobility and stability of that joint. So the area that it may be injured or causing pain or I broke or whatever it, it may be, as I start to heal and get better, the first emphasis that I put on any sort of training is training the movement. So having stability right. and making sure I have a good range of motion because after you end up healing in an area, we also tend to build up a bunch of scar tissue that tends to limit your range of motion. And if you go back to just a strength training that area with a, a, a even shortened range of motion, now you're you're setting yourself up for Well, potential. this is why, too, yeah, I don't like blunting the signal like as much as possible because I want to find the threshold. I want to find where that lies in terms of like my body's natural signal to tell me, oh, okay, that's that's the range. You know, I'm going to move into that uh, angle and that position and, and, you know, keep gradually working my way uh, towards, you know, maybe expanding upon that. But it's a gradual process. And, yeah. and when I am trying to do that, then I'm going to come back and, you know, obviously it's going to aggravate it a little bit, which may, you know, this is where ice for me is definitely an answer to, to lowering the inflammation. Yeah. And ice can slow down recovery as well because it does slow down blood flow. It's good for pain relief. This is what's good about ice. If you have a little bit of pain, you can use ice. It's natural. It doesn't have the systemic inflama inflammatory lowering uh, effect like uh, like drugs. Um, but when I say focus on healing, what I mean is because if you're a hardcore fitness fanatic and you're really worried about losing muscle when you're injured, you tend to be terrible at resting when you're supposed to. I know uh, I did. Yeah. I was. If the doctor says to me, hey, stay off your foot for the next four days, mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking to myself, well, he doesn't really mean 
stay off of it. Like I could walk around a little bit. I think I know. <laughs> and and the, here, this is the challenge. The challenge is you're worried. It's you're so worried about losing muscle that you won't literally follow the doctor's advice. That's number one. Listen to what they say. If they say rest it, let it heal, then you should rest it and let it heal. I've I've trained female athletes who got breast augmentation who were so afraid of losing shoulder and chest muscles that they went and started working out and messed up the implants and caused uh, yeah. you know the the implant to shift in its cavity and to cause different problems. Um, that's one example. I've had examples of, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've trained male athletes that had like a bicep tear and the doctor's like, don't do anything with your biceps for the next, you know, three months or whatever. They thought, well, I'm just going to go light. That's what well, I'm going to do. Re-tearing the, where they had reattached the muscle. So really focus on healing really is take their advice. And if they say, don't move it, that's okay. Don't, yes, you'll lose muscle. It'll come back faster though. If you let it heal properly. This is also too, it brings up a point for me when um, talking to the doctor, this is a crucial thing to ask as many questions as possible. I think people do a terrible job of getting like all of that stuff really defined in terms of, you know, what does that mean in terms of resting? Like what is my leg elevated the whole time? Like what, what are the actual steps like throughout my day look like and have them kind of outline that whole thing for you because you know the, the more information the, the better and so like I actually like I had I had uh, Courtney would come into some of my appointments and would sort of act as an advocate for a lot of like different types of uh, medications and things they present and you know you like the worst thing you can do is just kind of nod your head like you understand them but not really understand them not ask more questions and yeah. so i just find that very common for a lot of people they don't ask enough questions well i also think i mean i'm going to keep hammering the the mobility thing down and, and stability and, and range of motion because i mean it, this is so close to home for me when i talk about my achilles tear that i just had and because i opted not to do the surgery and i healed myself it did take much longer and still to this day I have to put a little more energy and effort into a combat stretch on that side more than I need to do on the other side because it is still a little stiffer than my right side. And so that focus has to be there. I mean, when we created Prime Pro, I really like one of my, my favorite things about that program is I really feel like it is the perfect bridge from physical therapy. So if you're somebody who has a, an injury like that was uh, acute to where you had surgery or something broken and you go and you are cast up or whatever mm -hmm. and you see your doctor, then the next thing after that, they send you to physical therapy. Physical therapy basically gets you to heal and get it better and at least being able to move it again. Then you take your cast off or then you're, you're released. And from that moment of being released from physical therapy, yeah, you're not done. You're not done. No. Like going right back to training just because they, they have they've said, OK, you're, you're healed. Now go back. If you go back from there and go right back into your normal training routine, what you'll find is that that area that was injured more often than not is going to have all this scar tissue buildup and you're going to have limited range of motion. And if you just go into training and you neglect putting that extra effort into working on the mobility and stability portion and range of motion of uh, of at that joint or that injured area, uh, that is the that is the most ideal way to segue back into. And again, it prolongs the going to build a lot of muscle aggressively. At first. At first, but it's laying the foundation so that it does come back fast and that you don't end up re-injuring right. yourself. Or because what will end up happening, here's what happens, you hurt your shoulder because you have uh, in, you know muscle recruitment pattern issues or movement issues because uh, let's say your left shoulder is moving not in the ideal way. So you end up hurting it. You go to the you, you wait you let it heal go to the physical therapist do physical therapy range of motion is back by the way that's what physical therapists uh, real job is that's what the insurance pays them to do is kind of bring back a normal what they'll say range of motion it's not to bring back strength not to bring back uh, the stability that you had before but rather just give you the range of motion so then you go back to the gym without really working on correctional exercise and you're like I'm gonna go work out I'm gonna just gonna go work out mm -hmm. you're gonna have more compensations than you did, than you did before if anything. You'll make whatever caused your shoulder to get hurt worse. You'll cause worse movement pattern issues. Rather than healing and solving the issue, you'll you'll make things a lot worse later on. So that gradual process is is very important. Well, and this is also assuming that you have a really good physical therapist too. You know, just like there's bad trainers, there's bad chiropractors, there's also bad physical therapists. There's physical therapists that will 
get not get your old range of motion back. They'll get you back range of motion that allows you to do daily functions, which means walking, sitting, That's why I did standing. the quote marks. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. not – many times it's not ideal. Many times it's not back to the your, your range of motion you had before that. It's good enough for you to walk. It's good enough for you to mm-hmm. get up and down. It's good enough for you to reach above your head, whatever, wherever the injury may be. That's what a lot of them focus on, and that a lot of times is not enough – to prevent it from happening again to right. you, it's enough for you to get by, and then you go back again to strength training, and then we re-injure it again. So I can't stress enough that when you get back into your training, and so like the next point is, you know, train what you can. Well, part of training what you can isn't just training the other body, which that is a point too. It's also focusing on that area and working on the mobility and range of motion. You've got to put the energy and focus there that needs to be, I think, a staple mm-hmm. in the beginning of your re- recovery. Right. But you know, the, the the second point being train what you can also refers to this. Okay. I've known this to happen uh, with people. They hurt their their knee. So now they can't go and do their normal leg workouts. They're doing some correctional stuff. Let's say they're doing some, you know, Prime Pro, some Maps Prime Pro type stuff for the lower body, but because they can't go in the gym and really work their legs, they also neglect working their upper body. Mm. So now they're not working out at all. Okay, studies show that not lifting weights at all uh, accelerates the muscle and strength loss that you may get from your injury. No joke. Literally, going to the gym and working out other areas actually reduces some of the muscle loss you'll have in the injured area. So just because your upper body, it's even more common for people with upper, I think for guys at least, to have an upper body injury and then just not go to the gym and work out legs either. If you hurt your upper body, if you hurt your shoulder or your elbow, you can still work out your legs. You should. You should still work your legs out. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to not lose muscle in your upper body, but believe it or not, you actually lose less muscle mm-hmm. in your upper body because you work your legs. When Whenever you work out, when especially with resistance training, most of the muscle building signal is local, meaning most of the muscle building signal goes to the area that you're training. But there is a lesser powerful but still real muscle building signal that's systemic. Mm -hmm. So working your legs out does send a a large signal to build muscle in your legs, but it sends a smaller signal to build muscle in the rest of your body. There are some very interesting studies that are out uh, that are old, and they've done a few of these where – People will have a one arm immobilized, and they'll have a control group. So one group does nothing. Then they'll have another group that works out the other arm, and they find that the group that works out the other arm loses less muscle in the arm that was immobilized, mm-hmm. even even though it's it's a different arm. So train what you can also means whatever your injury is, avoid training it or correct do correctional exercise or whatever is appropriate. But that doesn't mean you should not work out the rest of your body. Find ways to do so. So, like with me, with my shoulder injury at that time, that meant I couldn't do barbell squats because I couldn't hold the bar behind my back. I couldn't hold dumbbells for lunges. This is when machines were great for me. I got went to the gym and I'm like, well, I can leg press. I can literally sit in this chair and do a leg press. I can literally sit in a chair and do a leg extension or a leg curl. And I did do those things. And I do think that those contributed to my faster. Well, recovery. you know, this is what machines were. I know. This, this is this was the this is what they're good most for. valuable part. Well, of this machines. is what they originally were designed for. Yeah. Uh, they were originally designed for rehabilitation. They, they were made for that. We just can't, we found out that they were just so effective at it that they mm-hmm. also built some muscle. And so they've, they've now bled into like everybody's routine. But the reality is, and I know we harp for a long time, Mind Pump has harped on a lot of, you know, machine exercises taking over your routine and, and eliminating the the barbell complex movements that are so important. But here's a, a classic example of where they have tremendous value. Yeah. And this is the reason why they have tremendous value is because you are in a fixed position, right? The body's in a fixed position. And if you have an injury, you can pick machines that lock that injury area in a fixed position that it's not at risk while you're lifting, you know, potentially heavy weight in other areas of mm-hmm. your body. So this is where I do see tremendous value in machines. Totally. So so aside from the correctional exercise and the appropriate stuff you can do from the area uh, that's injured, train the rest of your body. By the way, this is even something you can do when you can't move the injured area. You know, if your leg is in a cast and you're not, you can't do really any correctional exercise. You can still work out your upper body. You can still do seated exercises and seated presses and bench presses and 
uh, machine rows and curls and those types of exercises. So still train the rest of your body. And because here's the fear, I think some people, number one, they're unmotivated because like, what's the use? I can't you know, work my upper body. So what's the use of training my legs or I can't mm. work my legs. What's the use of working my upper body? Mm -hmm. Get over that. That's, that's the, you know, go train what you can. But here's the second uh, part to it. I think that there's a bit of a fear where the person thinks I'm going to, uh, I'm going to make, if my, if I can't work out my legs and I just work on my upper body, I'm going to cause an even greater discrepancy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make it even more of an issue because my legs going to get so weak and my upper body is going to continue to get stronger. Not true. Mm -hmm. The muscle memory brings you back very, very quickly. And again, I'm going to reiterate this, that general muscle building signal that you send reduces the amount of muscle that you lose in the area that you can't, that you can't work. And when you go back to training it, it makes the muscle memory that much more effective. Believe it or not, although you can create big imbalances, there is the, there are some safeguards where your body tries to keep things a little bit more balanced. So training what you can is a very, very uh, it's a very important part of training. And I and look, the next point I think kind of speaks to this as well because part of what happens when you're injured is you you stop training that area, mm. you start to lose motivation, and what tends to fall with yeah, that is- You gotta dial in that nutrition. Yeah, you stop training everything. I hurt my leg, now I'm not training my arms either, everything. And what's the use of eating a good diet, right? Yeah, right. What's the use of eating a high protein diet? I'm not working out anyway. Huge mistake. Mm. This is a huge mistake. This is where the comfort food and the junk food kind of creeps in is, you know, you're, you're again, psychologically, this is where uh, you want to feel better. And so you're going to gravitate towards a lot of the foods that are comfort foods and things like that. Yeah. It's that all or nothing mentality, right? right. If I can't do this and I'm not doing anything, so I'm going well, that'll make the healing process take longer and it makes the recovery and the road back process take a lot longer. Now, do you see any value in even increasing your protein intake during this time? I do. Mm. A high protein diet uh, by itself will build a little bit of muscle. It preserves muscle in people who are not moving. So if you have like a patient who's literally bedridden and you increase their protein, they notice less muscle loss as a result. So it's protective. Mm. Now, I will say this. If you're not moving as much as, much as you were before, I wouldn't necessarily bump my calories really high. I might control my calories a little bit, but I would make up for it with higher protein. So you can reduce your carbs a little bit mm -hmm. and then increase your protein. So maybe your calories don't go up, but your protein intake uh, definitely goes up. And remember, protein provides you with the building blocks of tissue, muscle in particular. So you want to keep it high. So for somebody who's trying to build muscle and somebody who's trying to heal, I would recommend about a gram of protein per pound uh, of body weight. So whatever your body weight is, hit that number in protein and keep it that way. And you're still going to lose muscle. You're still going to lose strength, but you'll lose less because your protein intake. Well, you, you glazed over the calorie thing, which I think that we have to talk, even though we're, this is about protein, it's also about re recalculating and recalibrating uh, the, the amount of calories you should be consuming too. So you, you know, obviously, if you were somebody who was training very, very uh, intensely for a consistent period of time, and then all of a sudden you go and you're sedentary, especially if it's an, a lower body injury, which is keeping you from even walking around mm -hmm. very much and moving, you do need to keep in mind that you're probably going to have to reduce calories dramatically. And so, based off of how, and that's going to be, it, it's going, and the reason why I won't give you a number is because it's going to be a huge range depending on your size yeah. and how much your movement is limited, but it's something you need to think about. So you reduce calories, but at the same time, you don't want to end up reducing protein so low that you're not hitting even those minimum targets. Yeah. So let's say you cut your, you want to, you could cut your calories by 300 calories or 400 calories and still increase your protein. And the way you would cut your calories would be by cutting some carbs, maybe cutting some fat calories. So let's say you cut, you know, 500 calories from carbs and fats and then you increased your protein intake by 200 calories. You're still at a deficit of 300 calories, but you're now consuming more protein than you were before, and that should have a protective effect uh, on muscle. Um, now, the next one, this is a good one, and there's kind of two ways to do this. So um, this is using static tension. So static tension allows you to activate a muscle without moving a joint. So mm -hmm. let's say my shoulder is injured and I can't do a bench press, I can't do a row, I can't do a shoulder press, but I can keep my arms immobile and flex 
my pec or flex my lats and create tension in that area. Now, for some people, this is going to be okay. For other people, just flexing the area might be a little bit too much. In this case, this is where stim can be valuable. And stim kind of does what static tension does to a much less degree. Static tension is better. Mm -hmm. But stim is, those are the pads that you put on your muscle and it causes the muscle to flex on its own. These days, luckily, stim machines are super cheap. I could go on Amazon and buy one for, for 20 or 30 bucks and Physical therapists have used them for a long time, and they do reduce the amount of uh, muscle that you lose when you're not moving. But this is really an important point because this this is that signal that you're providing, uh, you know, to the support system around the joint where the problem lies, and and to be able to start creating uh, more, uh, you know, of a rigid structure that you know is telling your body like you have the safety now to you know, start producing movement, uh, you know, around this joint again, like everything is sort of accounted for. Um, that's part of the process is really being able to flex and, and connect and, and, and provide that, that stability there around the joint. Well, this is, and when you, we talked, I talked about prime pro, right? So prime pro uh, that a lot of those movements are static tension movements, mm -hmm. right? We take the muscle to its end range of motion and then we connect to it and we create tension. So this is this is what this is all about, and even though I I, I used a, an a e stim machine, right? So I think those are great bridges for this time. Like, like Sal made the point, like if it's so injured still that you can't even flex it, it hurts. Like, mm -hmm. okay, e stim makes sense, but I I also caution people that use that because you're also creating an, an artificial communication to the muscle to stimulate it. Mm -hmm. You're not using it intrinsically. You're not using the mainframe. You're not using your brain to fire that muscle. And we don't want to lose that communication. And we don't want to like artificially bring something else in for a long period of time that we don't re retrain the connection from the brain to those muscles. So it's a great bridge for somebody that it hurts to do that right now to get some sort of artificial stimulation. But for the long, long term, you want to get to the point where you can actually connect to the muscle and create tension yourself. And that's, again, Prime Pro takes you through every major joint in the entire body and, and will help that. So I don't care what injury you have, there's movements and exercises in that program that will help that person out. And that's where you spend a majority of your time when you're starting to rehab. Yeah, when, it, when my, I had my shoulder in the, you know, in the brace and then finally when I was – when I could – activated a little bit. I couldn't, I didn't have a, a range of motion. So it wasn't like I could lift my arm. That was too much. But what I could do is lean up against the wall. And what I did is I'd lean up against the wall, pull my arm up against the wall, and then I'd just push up against the wall. So my arm didn't move, but I would activate the shoulder muscle. And when I started doing that, when it was appropriate, the recovery really started to take off. This is how you use static tension. Let's say your knee is injured. Once it becomes appropriate, you could literally flex, just flex the quad. Just focus on flexing the quad. Maybe put your foot up against something that doesn't move like the wall and then push against the wall. Don't move the joint, just activate the muscle. That activation alone prevents muscle loss and maintains that connection. Well, and also going back to like we're talking about the threshold so you know sort of where your boundaries are, like right up in front of that threshold is where I really want to kind of squeeze and connect and, and provide stability because that's what's now going to provide that feedback to your body that okay now we can now that that's secure we can we can press a little further forward and gain just a little bit more range of motion. Yeah. Now the last point is a is a relatively new one that I've started using. I would say in the last maybe 6 years, 5 or 6 years. Before that I wasn't super familiar with it, but it's also one of the most exciting. Um, and that's blood flow restriction training. It's exciting because uh, nothing that we have tested or seen can maintain muscle or even build muscle on an injured joint like BFR. It's actually, no joke, studies will show that it it's similar. It's not the same, but it's similar to lifting weights mm -hmm. like you normally would lift weights. Like there's no recovery, you know, uh, tool. There's no, um, you know, healing tool. There's nothing that the physical therapist provided before that would – that even comes close to what BFR could do mm -hmm. in terms of maintaining or even building muscle. And Without so, putting a lot of impact uh, in that uh, injured well, joint. That's the thing. Like if, if your knee's injured, in order to really build it back and to build muscle, you'd have to wait for it to be fully healed so you could do your normal exercise, your squats, your lunges, your leg press, or whatever. 
Um, up until that point, it's basically about preventing as much muscle loss as possible, but you're going to lose some muscle. BFR has actually shown yeah. to stop increase muscle to stop the muscle loss and then maybe even build a little bit, which is really crazy. So the way BFR works is you and it's much more effective for the limbs, so the arms and the legs, is to tie off the limb with like a, a, a knee wrap, um, and you tie it off so that you restrict some of the blood flow. You don't tie it off so tightly that you go numb, but enough to where you feel the blood flow is restricted and you feel some some tension. Then you do some light exercise. So let's say normally, let's say I have a knee injury. It still hurts a little too much. I can't do body weight squats. I can't do barbell squats, but I can walk and I can move it. So I can move it a little bit. And I get on the leg uh, extension machine. And let's say normally I use 150 pounds when I'm he- when I'm healthy on the leg extension machine. Well, with BFR, I would tie off my leg with a knee wrap. I'd get on the leg extension machine. And let's say at the moment, my knee can handle 20 pounds. Like that's it. More than that, it's too much for my knee joint, but 20 pounds is about appropriate. Under normal circumstances, 20 pounds wouldn't build muscle because the muscles that I had built before could handle 150 pounds. But now that I've restricted the blood, it prevents, it actually starves the muscles of oxygen, making, training them as if they were trained under high loads. So now I'm doing the 20 pound leg extensions and as I'm doing reps, and this is what you'll experience, you will feel burning in the muscle Mm -hmm. like if you're doing something with much more weight. You do a few sets like this, you get an incredible pump, and it actually tricks the muscles into thinking they're being trained with heavier weight. And it's a remarkable – it's so remarkable, in fact, that people who don't need to heal their body from injury can use BFR – to build their body parts anyway. That's how effective it is. Well, here's a cool thing too. If you, uh, this is so uh, so new that if you have a physical therapist that is utilizing this, you probably have a better th- physical therapist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a good litmus test. Yeah, this is something that is, is you know, it's relatively new. It's what, six years or so, six, seven years is when it- when Started it, hitting kind of the, the re- Yeah, yet. it was, uh, it started in the sports world, of course, right? Where, where lots of money is at stake and getting these athletes back on the field or back on the ice or, because I believe it was hockey where it became popular first. Um, you know, that is where we found this research and that, and then it slowly has made its way into your, your standard physical therapy and then now into the, the bodybuilding and training world, but it's still relatively new. So if you have a physical therapist that went to school 15, 20 years ago and they're rehabbing you, they may not even be utilizing this. And I think it's one of the coolest things. I mean, that I've came across in the last decade for sure in training that has been like a new hack that we didn't know. I use BFR all the time. I mean, we, uh, what, three years ago, three, four years ago, we created a, a guide. So we have a a BFR guide. It's the occlusion training guide, I think we call it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we also have done some free content on YouTube, our Mind Pump TV channel. So if you want to see how we utilize it, we actually, I think in the YouTube channel, we're talking about how to utilize it for building muscle uh, by itself. But this is incredible for rehab. And this, in in my opinion, like this is like the next, so you talk about physical, physical therapies first, then you get into a lot of like the prime pro type of work and BFR, it was really, I think, the way you should be lifting weights and training initially mm-hmm. before you start to load and, and do anything like that. Yeah, it's extremely uh, effective. It's a wonderful tool. In fact, it's a it's a tool that we we you know I even recommended I think a couple times for people when they were training at home with no equipment during you know the the pandemic. Uh, and so it's a great way to prevent uh, muscle loss, but. But that's pretty, you know, what we just told you really is the roadmap to preventing muscle loss and to getting you back on your feet as quickly as possible. You know, number one, though, is to focus on recovery and healing. If you don't recover properly and get your body to heal properly, nothing we said will help. Mm -hmm. You'll be stuck on this hamster uh, wheel of continued pain and injury and not being able to get back to where you were before. But Keep in mind, muscle memory is a real thing, and if you do it right and if you heal yourself right, getting back to where you where you were before can be a very fast and rewarding process, and if you do it the right way, you'll get back better than you were uh, before. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio, so if you want to watch the show, check us out on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Doug, the producer at Mind Pump Doug. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.
It's not that I can't change a light bulb, you know? And so last night she's like, we get done bathing Max or whatever. She's like, could you, uh, could you bathe Max tonight so I can go change the light bulb in the closet? And I'm like, and you're oh, like, wait a minute. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All, right. All, right. All right, now you're challenging yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I, Hold on. 